turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Two more chapters in this book. And then we'll begin the Gospel of Matthew. We're getting midway through the chapter, so in typical fashion, we always read the chapter from the beginning and get up to where we left off. So let's pray and then do that. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for our time to open this book once again. We thank you for the verse-by-verse -verse study time we've had in it for these months, and, and, and we pray in such a practical section tonight that we'd be edified and not only remembering who we are in Christ, but also what we're to do as those in Christ. So may the Holy Spirit guide us and encourage us in this. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, let's start reading in verse 1. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, which are the, the believers of the Old Testament times in chapter 11 who walked by faith, which was to give them encouragement in their times of distress and suffering and trial. He said, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So God tells us to remove sin out of our lives. We confess sin, we move it aside, and then we run the race that He has put before us. And how do we do this? Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him, which is the kingdom he would rule in the future, he endured the cross. So he endured the temporary suffering of the cross, knowing what was coming in the future after his death, burial, and resurrection. Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, which is a mandate, we're to consider Jesus, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood and your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which, addressed you to, which is addressed to you as sons. And now he... See, they have forgotten the scripture of Proverbs 3. And all their difficulty, they, they needed to remember something. And he quotes Proverbs 3. My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, for those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. So we spent a couple of lessons on scriptures with this word uh, discipline. Uh, there's a noun and a verb. The verb is paiduo. The noun is paideia in the Greek. And this is not simply divine punishment, as they say, the whipping. It can include that, depending on context, but it also uh, includes the entire training program that a, a parent has for his child. And so God has an entire training program, which could even be affirming when you're walking correctly. And I, I think parents will do that too. It's not just simply the punitive discipline. It's the training of the child the whole way through their lives. Even when they're walking holy with God, you can affirm that and encourage that. So it's a very broad term. It is for discipline that you endure uh, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which you've all become partakers, then if you are without discipline, of which you've all become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, now he goes to the earthly example to the spiritual. Very common uh, with rabbis, with the Hebrew scriptures, with Jesus. He'd, he'd give parables and then move it into a spiritual application. He says, furthermore, we had earthly fathers, literally in the Greek, fathers of the flesh, which are our human fathers, to discipline us, and we respected them. Now watch to, to the greater, how much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live. And so the father of spirits is God the father. Life isn't go to heaven when you die. Life in the Bible often means a quality of life when you obey God. And that's the way it's being used here. For they, the human fathers, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he, God, God the Father, the Father of spirits from verse 9, he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. And that's now. We can walk in sanctification or holiness now 
and enjoy that fellowship with God. He says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So if you're willing to go through God's training program and all that it entails, and some of it is uh, sorrowful, it's not easy. Um, If you're willing to be trained by that, then it will uh, yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So now we move to verse 12 and 13. So after saying all that, he says, Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Um, Is this something you should take out of context and use at a gym? And put that above the the door of the gym. Uh, No, I don't think so, but it's very common for writers to use a physical illustration to get to a spiritual. I mean, Paul says we're all parts of the body of Christ, and he starts going through all the human body parts, arms, legs, and all this. It doesn't mean we're literally that, but there's many parts in, in our physical body, therefore in the body of Christ there's many giftedness or many gifted people within that body that have a certain function. So the writer uses a physical illustration to get to a spiritual application. It isn't that he means his audience has physically weak hands and bad knees and need to go to the gym or get physical therapy. I mean, there may be a place for that, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here. Even if his audience was in perfect health and strong as an ox, he would still say this to them based on what they were going through and their spiritual weariness. So he's speaking of spiritual weakness and the desire of his audience to give up under persecution. What did he just say in 12, 1 through 3? Keep your eyes focused on Jesus so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And then he goes on with the limbs, the lame uh, uh, limb and so forth. So in a physical sense, for a person with a a limb that's lame, could be put out of joint and injured further if he's walking on crooked or an uneven path. But is that what he means for us in the spiritual life, that you go find a a level path to walk on physically? No, it's spiritual. So in a spiritual sense, a believer needs to walk on a path of spiritual righteousness for spiritual health and healing. So what path would that be? The, The Remove sin and uh, set it aside and run the race with endurance. So you're running on a path he's set forward. And I think of Psalm uh, 119, 105. Remember the psalmist says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and finish it. A light to my path. So what is his word? It's a light. It lights the path you should walk. And so this is that straight path that they need to be on. Um, and therefore, it's spiritual. So, you have the word healed. Most people think when they hear healed, it's always physical. I got my leg healed. I'm healed from this and this or that. The Greek word is iaomai. Now, when you, it means to heal or cure. It can have a physical sense, but a spiritual sense as well. This is the same word used extensively in the four Gospels. You'll find it sprinkled all through when Jesus healed people from disease. That's the same word that's used. So he would did all these messianic miracles, healing people to show that he was the Messiah, but that physical healing, aren't they going to die anyway? Uh, hey, you can make them whole, they're still going to go through physical death. So what he's showing is through all of that, I can heal the nation because in the Old Testament, Messiah would rule in his kingdom and bring healing to the nation. Um, He's removing demons out of demon-possessed people because he's showing that I'm here and I can defeat the serpent who I was here to crush, right? Genesis 3.15, I'll crush his head. I can remove Satan from among you, therefore I can remove the nations that Satan rules from your midst and set up the kingdom. So he's doing certain things to make a point about his messiahship, and healing was, was a great one that he did to show. Now, after in John 12, after he had healed many people by that time in his earthly ministry, 
It's interesting that this word is used for spiritual healing and restoration. Um, Remember when Jesus in John 12 is talking to his audience, and then he quotes concerning the Jews, Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. And so, and what he's doing is showing if they return to him in obedience and repentance, he would heal them spiritually. Um, And then, of course, if he establishes the kingdom when they come back, uh, at their resurrection, what are they going to get? A healed body too. But in John 12, 40, he says this about Israel. He, God, has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. Did God really blind them physically? They're all walking around and can't see. No, it's spiritual blindness. Because they they rejected him, now they're spiritually blinded. Reject light, you get night. Reject his word, uh, you get something in return. So if you read the whole book of Isaiah, God had sent his word through the prophet over and over and over. Then you get to chapter 6, and he says this, and then, the, so the, the blindness was their fault. They chose it because they rejected God. There's always a trade-off there. So he says, God has blinded their eyes and it has hardened their heart. Now, their heart there is for uh, where they think, right? He's, they didn't, he gave them bad arteries, so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and return, and I would do what? I would heal them. He's talking about the whole nation coming back for spiritual healing under the Messiah. And Jesus is right there to do that, and they won't have it. So this is a spiritual healing and restoration when Israel is established in their kingdom after national repentance. Now, another place where I think it's spiritual healing is 1 Peter 2.24 where it says, He Himself bore our sins in His own body on the cross, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. And then He says this, for by His wound, it's, it's singular in the Greek, the wound of the cross where He bore our sins, for by His wound you were healed. Now, does it say you will be healed? Now, I checked the Greek, it's a past tense. Yeah, you were healed. So, when, if he's talking to you right now as a believer, when were you healed in that passage? When you believed the gospel. And at that moment, you were spiritually healed, I think, from the deadly effects of sin. Because a lot of people get saved, and the day they get saved, are they physically healed of every malady? No, some, in 10 days, they're dead because of something they got. But when they get resurrected, there's not going to be any physical problems either. So here I think the healing is a spiritual thing, but physical healing will come when God makes us whole because the fall has affected everything, including our physical bodies, and now we physically die, Uh, but one day we will never die. There will never be any uh, pain or sorrow or anything, no sin, anything anymore, and for, uh, for eternity after the resurrection we'll be whole. So is there an Old Testament component to these two verses? You know there is because I asked. Um, how about Isaiah 35.3 and Proverbs 4.26? Listen to the similar words. <clears throat> Isaiah 35.3 says, Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Now again, is this physical? Or is there the spiritual ex- being exhausted? Uh, just like there, they're, they're giving up, they're growing weary, they're losing heart in Hebrews, and now they need to strengthen the feeble, and I don't think that's physical, it's spiritual. Proverbs 4.26, watch, watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Well, he tells them to make straight paths for your feet. Again, walk holy with the Lord according to his word. Remember, you don't make your own path. You follow God's path and exactly as He says to in Scripture. And the Bible is fully equipped to tell us everything we need to do. So the writer uses these two Old Testament passages to encourage his audience to follow the way that God has provided so that they won't be tripped up into spiritual lameness, but rather spiritually healed and healthy. So again, lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and Let us run the race with endurance and so forth. Now, um, 
at this point, when you, I think there are four Jewish epistles that are really focused on the Jewish people that have application for us too. Remember which ones? First and Second Peter, Jude, Hebrews, and James. I mean, is James to the Jewish people? I mean, Peter writes to the, the chosen that are scattered. Those are the Jews. Uh, James says in James 1, to the 12 tribes dispersed. Okay, who are the 12 tribes? The 12 tribes of Israel who have now been dispersed through persecution in the first century. So go to James 4. I see a parallel. There's a lot of parallels with these Jewish epistles. They say a lot of the same thing. Uh, and Paul, and then these uh, epistles to the Gentiles primarily, will do the same. But it's almost like these Jewish writers got together and said, hey, let's compare notes here. And but James will do something similar with his audience that the writer of Hebrews does. Now, what you'll see in James is very common, kind of like Hebrews. Remember, Hebrews has five major warnings sprinkled throughout the whole book. The first one's in chapter 2, and then they go all the way to chapter 12. But he'll give them a harsh warning about what they're doing wrong, and then what does he do? He gives doctrine about Jesus is the main thing to focus on, and then he gives a remedy of how to walk properly. And James does that also in chapter 2. Remember, he tells them you need to be a hearer and a doer of the word, chapter 1. And then he says, here's where you're not doing that with the rich man and the poor man. The wealthy guy comes in the congregation and a poor man does. You put the poor man at your feet and you show favoritism to the wealthy guy. You're not, you're not keeping the law of love. Um, he'll, he'll do that through the book. He talks about the sins of the tongue in chapter 3 and then he tells them how to walk properly and how to tame the tongue. Now you get to chapter 4 and... In chapter 4, 1 through 6, there's all this hating and quarreling with each other in the congregation. And then he follows with an encouragement of what to do. Look at verse 6. Well, he concludes, God gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So proud believers can be humbled, but humble believers will be exalted. So then he says in 4.7, here's what you got to do. Because you're not doing it, so you got to do this. He says, submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Well, the way they were treating each other, they're not resisting the devil. They're just kind of inviting him in, if you will. So submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Um, and one of the best ways to resist the devil is how? What did Jesus do? He just quoted scripture to him and he left. Remember in the wilderness, he, Satan came to him with those temptations and all three times he came back with the word. That's all he said. Here's the word and you're wrong, so here's what you, I'm going to say to you. And Satan, he left him, but one of the gospels says, but he came, he waited for an opportune time to come back. <laughs> and he'll do that with you too. So you got to continually resist the devil in such a way. Now here's verse 8. Draw near to God as a believer. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Well, how do you do that? Well, you confess sin, you set it aside, and you start walking with him again. And then he'll draw near to you, which will get mean intimate fellowship that a, a carnal Christian or a Christian grieving the Spirit will not experience in the same way. So you can be in the family of God but not enjoying that relationship. Then he says another command Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Same thing the writer of Hebrews is saying when he tells them to strengthen the parts of their body. Now he says, cleanse your hands. Is he really saying go to the sink and sterilize your hands? He's not talking about that. He's talking about spiritual. I mean, even the, the, the high priest, when he went in on the Day of Atonement to uh, do the sacrifice in the Holy of Holies, he had to wash in a laver, and what did he wash? his hands and his feet. In other words, he's preparing to be in fellowship with God before he goes into divine service. So cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, be careful with verse 9. All by itself, <laughs> it's not the, it's not, I always say it's not a good calendar verse to put on a, on a calendar. You're like, what does that mean? God tells you, be miserable and mourn and weep. 
So don't laugh in this church ever. I want you miserable when you come in, right? That's not what he means. And then he says, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, Jesus said something similar in his ministry because when Israel was in covenant violation as a nation, they're walking in sin and need repentance. He would tell them, you need to be mourning over this, not joyful. And so he, when he says, blessed are those who mourn, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Really? So if I'm sad all the time, I get to heaven? No. You'll enter the kingdom. Uh, you'll be blessed by God if you're mourning over covenant violation. And the Jews weren't doing that. And um, some were when John the Baptist came to baptize Israel for repentance. How many were coming out confessing their sins? See, they understand they're in failure and they're coming back to God. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is saying the same thing. So he just mentioned all this sin they have in early chapter 4. He goes, you ought to be miserable and mourning and weeping over that. Jesus said, hey, if you weep now, you will laugh later. In other words, when I bring in the kingdom, you're going to have joy. So be miserable, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. In other words, you ought to be grieving over your sin. And then verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he'll exalt you because he, he makes war with the proud, like he said in verse 6, but he gives grace to the humble. And if you humble yourself before God, he'll exalt you in your, in your walk. So Jesus, did he ever have any parables about humility and exaltation? The guy that picks, he walks into the banquet and takes the head of the table. Uh-oh. Well, you're at the place of honor. We got to put you down at the other end of the table. And, and then he says, he who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. So God loves humility. Uh, then verse 14. I'm sorry, I didn't go forward on that. But you had your Bibles open, so we'll just go to verse 14. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. We've got to work on this one. Uh, it's that second half of the verse has thrown people off a lot. But let's first start with the word pursue. Does everyone have pursue in their Bibles? Unless you're in a Spanish Bible. What do you have? Eng uh, pursue? Yeah, no, I have a work. Okay, okay, work at living. Well, the Greek word is dioko. Now, dioko means to persecute in some passages. You've got to look at context. All who desire to live godly will be persecuted, dioko. However, it can also mean to pursue or to pursue intently. And I think that's how it's used here. We need to pursue peace intently with all. And I want to bring up something else. Now, in the, sometimes the, just looking at the Greek verb system and understanding that tells you a lot about a word. Because this word is what they call a present active imperative. That's the form of the verb when you read it in Greek. Now, the present tense means now, right? So it's something they need to be doing ongoing now. The active voice, there's active, passive, and middle in Greek. This is an active voice, which means the subject produces the action. If it's passive, you're receiving the action. <clears throat> so if it's active, what does this tell you? You've got to make the volitional choice to do it. A lot of people say, well, I got saved and God's going to automatically make me do everything. No. Well, then he's doing a bad job because we fail sometimes. It's not, we're not robots. We have, we have responsibility to apply these mandates. So we're commanded to do this. And as we choose to do this, God will empower us because it's not our power, it's his. He'll empower us to do so through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the command in Galatians 5.16 is walk by the Spirit. Well, that's a command for us to apply, but the fruits of the Spirit in 5.22 are from the Holy Spirit Himself who produces love, joy, peace, and all those wonderful fruits. So I see a cooperation there. I, don't, I think it's a danger to go to, to one way or the other and that's it. 
So notice the first thing uh, they were to pursue as well as us was peace. And peace with all, definitely including the believers among them. Again, peace, this word peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22, the first one's love and then joy and then peace is the third one, same word. So let's look at some other passages about this pursuit of peace. Go to, um, let's go to 1 Peter 3. A lot of application in these verses tonight. This is about the walk. So in 1 Peter 3, Peter's been telling them throughout the book things that we got to do. His audience, you got to do this. And then he says in verse 8 of chapter 3 to sum up. So he's been going through a lot of this stuff throughout the book. So to sum it all up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. So there's that humility idea coming in again. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a, a, a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For, verse 10, the one who desires life to love and see good days. Now, what is life there? Go to heaven? No, it's a quality of spiritual life now. He must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. And here it is. He must seek peace and pursue it. So now he's got two words for seeking. And the second word, pursue, pursue it, is dioko. So we have to make the choice to do that. And here are some I have here on the slide. I think I got three different passages. Paul writing to T Pastor Timothy, which would apply to all of us here, even though we're not pastors. But he says in verse 11, but flee from these things. He's talking about sin. You man of God and pursue, there's Dioko in the imperative, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Some of these are the fruits of the Spirit of Galatians 5, but does Galatians 5 limit the list? No. Uh, all these are fruits of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 2.22, now flee from youthful lusts. He sure tells Timothy to flee a lot, doesn't he, <laughs> from certain things. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. There's peace there. With all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So all believers who are fellowshipping, fellowshipping with God from a pure heart. So there's our, another command to pursue certain things. And I, what I keep noticing in the Bible we're to set aside sin, but as you go, that's all you need to do. Just don't worry about it. Just don't sin. Don't sin. Don't sin. You're good. Now, what does he always add? But do this. You know, always add something about the walk. It isn't simply avoiding sin, which you have to do in order to walk holy, because sin's an impediment to your walk, to your path. But then you've got to pursue something. All the time, the Bible does this. Now, down below, we have a, a longer passage. There was so much good scripture with it. I wanted to kind of read the broader section, but 1 Thessalonians 5.15, I'll go to verse 18. He says, see that no one repays another with evil for evil. Isn't that just what Peter said? But always pursue, there's the Oko, pursue after the things which, after that which is good for one another and for all people. Uh, didn't he just say earlier, have peace with all men, seek peace, pursue peace with all men in Hebrews, and Paul's saying the same thing. I guess all these men seem to worship the same God. <laughs> That's what I'm concluding. So this is an example of seeking peace. Rejoice always, 516. I mean, doesn't James say rejoice even in your trials? Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith develops endurance, and it grows, uh, grows you into maturity as well. So always rejoice and then pray without ceasing. Prasukaste, adialeptos. It doesn't mean 
pray 24 hours a day and never go to sleep. This would have the idea of pray continually. You ought to be communicating with God all day long, no matter what you're doing. I mean, if you're out mowing the yard, why can't you talk to God? Why can't you pray when you're driving, when you're in the shower, when you're at church? Um, it can be anywhere you want. So we, as they say, you need to keep very short accounts with God. And he's always available in prayer, right? And you don't have to go, oh, he's, I'm a hundred in line today. You know, take a ticket. Now, he, can, he can answer a million prayers at one time if he wants. Then in everything, give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So did Jesus talk about peace? Anyone know a verse? Yeah, my peace I, I leave with you. Good. See, sometimes y'all don't go to the ones I'm going to, but they're great. I could make slides of those. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he told the nation Israel, blessed are the peacemakers. It's a compound word with the, the normal word for peace. For they shall be called sons of God. Now, I understand sons of God here. You, you, you don't become a child of God because you're a peacemaker. But the sons of God was a representative term. So if you are walking in obedience to the Lord, and one of the things you're doing is you're making peace, then you're truly the representative of God as he would want you to live. So Jesus spoke about being a peacemaker. But he said, when I came, I actually came to make everyone in their own home enemies. That isn't what he wanted. But that's what the Messiah would do according to the book of Micah. He's going to be so controversial that he's going to turn his own people against each other. That was not his desire. But that's what ended up happening. And then he says as he rides into Jerusalem, Oh, if you just knew the things which make for peace. Uh, but you didn't see the time of your visitation. You didn't realize who I was and what I came to bring was the kingdom of peace. Because in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And he'll rule on David's throne and rule a perfect kingdom of peace. And they blew that. So they're to pursue peace, but what else? As well as us. Verse 14, what else do you see there? Sanctification. Now, we've done tremendous studies on this for long periods of time, especially in the Pauline epistles. I will be brief tonight for time reasons, but the word sanctification, does anyone have holiness in their translation? Okay, that's a good translation of the same word, hagiasmas. The verb hagiazo means to sanctify or to set apart. Hagias just as an adjective, holy. God is holy, it could be translated holy ones. So all this root means is to be set apart. Now, set apart to what? It depends on context. Did you all know in the Old Testament, the temple pr male prostitutes or the prostitutes that functioned in the pagan temples were called holy? In other words, they were set apart to the service of their false god. They're definitely not uh, what God would call holy in the sense of a good, good person <laughs> or walking in sanctification so the word just means set apart. The utensils in the tabernacle, what were they? Holy. But they're not even moral objects. They're, they're just made of material. But they were dedicated to the service of the tabernacle. Nothing else. You can't go use those as common items in your fellowship offering or meals and eat with those. Those belong in the, in the tabernacle and then in the temple. So when uh, the temple was destroyed... Uh, by the Babylonians, in the book of Daniel, what are they eating and drinking from in the chapter where the handwriting comes on the wall? From the holy goblets from the temple. You know how, what pro, how profane that was before God? You destroyed my temple, which I allowed the Babylonians to do because of Israel's sin, but you still took those articles, and now you're having your little party using those instruments. So you can see how the nations would profane God's holiness. 
So let's talk about this sanctification a little bit, being set apart. Would you agree that all believers are sanctified permanently in Christ Jesus at the moment of faith in the gospel? Yes, we're all, at the second we believe, we're permanently holy or set apart to God. First, I love it that Paul does this, or God gave us this through Paul to the Corinthians, because the Corinthian church was the worst church uh, revealed in the Bible as far as their walk. They're called carnal, sinful, all this stuff. But he opens the book in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and says, you're all sanctified in Christ Jesus. And he uses a tense that shows absolute, finished, complete action. It's done. 6.11, he calls them sanctified through Christ. Colossians 3.12, Paul tells Colossae, that church, uh, you're holy and or sanctified. You're set apart. So as those who are holy, walk a certain way. But I don't think Hebrews 12.14 is dealing with our position in Christ. It's dealing with our progress or our progressive sanctification, a holiness in their personal walk with God and our walk with God. So you are holy, right? And I, this is always fun to do when I was going into the jails. I always got to be careful I don't start a riot on and get everybody disagreeing with one another. They don't do well with that, even though they may be Christians. I saw some things in there. I'm like, <clears throat> I got to watch what I say. But uh, I'd ask, how many of you think you're as holy as Jesus? Nobody raised their hand. Well, I think what they thought is, they, do they think they're as good as Jesus? Well, of course not. We're all sinners, right? But they had never heard of positional sanctification. Because in Christ, what are we? If he's the Holy One of God, what are we in him? Perfectly holy. That's how he sees you. Now, he knows you sin. He knows you have the carnal issues and the flesh and all that. But in your position, God sees you in his son, so I'm as holy as he is. Now they're like, ah, oh, okay, okay, I'm, I'm holy. But I said, how many of you are walking as holy as Jesus walked? And no hands went up, and I said, good, because none of you have. But you can mimic that by walking according to the Spirit. He never failed. We do, but we can recover and walk by the Spirit. And I wish people understood positional sanctification better. I think it would clear up a lot. So here's a good passage that deals not with the position, but the walk. And you've heard me say it every communion. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Peter says, like the Holy One, that's God, who called you. So he's perfectly holy in every sense. He's set apart from every God because there are no other gods. He's the only one. There's no one like him. He's totally unique. He's absolutely sinless in every way, right? He's perfect. So he says, as the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your manner of life or behavior. Now, we're not going to be perfect at that, but we can walk holy with God. It's a possibility because he tells us to. And then he says, because it is written, and he quotes Leviticus, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's clearly the walk. So this holy walk, I think, looks back to you in Hebrews 12. Look at 12.10 again. Doesn't he say if we are trained by God's discipline, we can share in his what? Holiness. That's a walk. So if you want to walk obediently, you can share this fellowship with God in this way. But if they don't pursue sanctification in this holy walk, this is where it gets tricky for some. It says they will not see the Lord. Now, this one bothered me when I first became a, a Christian. Let me give you three options of what, how this has been interpreted, usually the ones I hear all the time. Do you, do you understand the problem or the difficulty? Does this mean you won't go to heaven? So if I don't walk in sanctification, I'll go to hell? which means I won't see the Lord in the future. Yeah, you'll never see him. He's going to cast you out eternally. And unbelievers will be cast out eternally. Is that what he means here? So that's the tension of this interpretation. And I've had a lot of people say you can lose your salvation and quote this to me. But let me give you three options. Number one, if a person doesn't walk in holiness, then he will not see God in heaven, which is what I just said. 
he'll lose his salvation and never see God in the future for eternity. Number two, if a person is not positionally sanctified, he'll never see God in heaven. Is that true? I don't think it's what he's saying here, but it's true. If you never get saved and get set apart to God in Christ Jesus, you'll never see him in the future. However, the problem with that is he's writing to believers. Why would he say, um, without sanctification, you won't see the Lord? But they're already sanctified positionally. So those are two options. I go with number three. If a person is not experientially sanctified, in other words, walking holy with God, he'll not see God in the sense of spiritual perception in this life. Now, how in the world did I get seeing and perception as, as a parallel? Well, don't we say even in English, when somebody doesn't understand, don't you see? Yeah, I'm fine. I got glasses. I see, I see great. Or I got 20-20 vision. No problem. Are we saying, don't you see physically? No, we're saying, don't you understand or perceive what I'm saying? Well, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that was still happening, and that's the way they spoke too. So again, all believers, here's a chart. I like to use these charts. So <clears throat> when you come to Christ, you go to the cross, you believe that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose on the third day. That's the gospel. If you believe that, God will save you from the penalty of sin. He'll impute perfect righteousness to your account once and for all. You'll become a permanent child of God. You'll be set apart or made holy in Christ. That's your position. But now he wants you to grow spiritually, so sanctification also has a process called holiness. And that's our passage here. And the goal of that is spiritual maturity. So the position is 1 Corinthians 1, 2, 6, 11, Colossians 3, 12, and other passages. And now Hebrews 12, 14 is dealing with the walk, that process. And the goal is spiritual maturity because James says if we endure trials, uh, we'll be made perfect and whole. Um, so that's maturity. So if we choose to walk in spiritual growth, well, let me say it this way. In your position, the day you got saved, especially me who had never read the Bible, I always told you all the only theology I really had was Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. Charlie Brown's Christmas story. Hey, at least in that, in that little cartoon, he got up and read the Gospel of Luke and the Christmas story. You could get saved watching that cartoon. And Charles Schultz knew that, how to reach kids. But I didn't know the Bible. I, I mean, I'd heard God's creator. He parted the Red Sea in the time of Moses. And so how well did I know God and perceive God the next day? Not very good. I'm saved. I knew that. But I don't know God. I mean, in, in any intimate terms, I don't know the Scripture yet. I hadn't even applied anything except in what the last 24 hours after being saved. So I started on my journey of learning the Bible and, you know, going through the situations of life, trying to apply it to that. And, and you start growing in progressive sanctification. And the more you do that, you're drawing near to God and He draws nearer to you and more intimacy comes to that person uh, who's doing so. So I tell Christians, look, if you want a close relationship with God, you've got to walk with Him. If you don't walk with Him, you're not going to come close to Him, but you're still His child. And you're really missing out. You know, dads say, oh, the one thing I regret about my life is that I wasn't there for my kids enough to watch them grow up. And, and God wants that time with us. And do we want to get to the end of our lives and say, God, I could have spent so much more time with God. And I never really developed that relationship. So we can deepen in that relationship spiritually and become more intimate. And if this process occurs, like on the slide, a believer will see the Lord or perceive the Lord in a sanctificational sense or in a deeper intimate sense in his walk with the Savior. Um, it kind of took me back as I went through that John 12 
passage with you earlier, as I looked at that today, I saw the connection because he says, Jesus says, seeing and perceiving are the same. Listen to this. John 12, 40, God has blind their, blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes nor perceive with their hearts. He changes the words from seeing to perceiving. Those are very close, closely connected. So the, it's not physical sight. They're, they're not perceiving God in their hearts. And if they would, they would return and I would heal the nation. But again, he's not saying if they don't obey God, they won't go to heaven when they die. Um, one writer said this, and I agree. He says, in view of, of the other references in Scripture to seeing the Lord, it may be best to understand the phrase as referring to a deeper Christian experience. In Matthew 5, 8 and 9, the pure in heart and the peacemakers will see God. Um, the peacemakers will be called sons of God, but those who or her pure in heart will see God. So if you're walking holy with God, you're pure in heart, what are you going to see? You're not going to, it's not that the heavens are going to open and you're going to see him on his throne. You're going to perceive God and have this intimacy. You'll really know him and walk with him. He goes on to say in Job 42, 5, Job came to see God as a result of his trial. The meaning is that he came to know God more deeply and intimately. So you know Job, I mean, it's a long book. It's over 40 chapters. So Job is put through the test. Remember, Satan is, is, is part of this. He's allowed to now put some pressure on Job because he says he's just going to curse your name. And God says, well, let's test this. And so Job does well at the beginning, and then he starts to waver. <laughs> and then his three friends come and tell him some really good advice, right? They don't do a very good job, and so it's through all this suffering and God's counsel, like in chapter 38. I love chapter 38 because he gives, a, I don't know, I forget how many questions, 40 plus or something. He starts asking Job all these questions. If you're so smart, where were you when I created the foundation of the world? You tell me, since you know. In other words, I'm God, I'm much bigger than you, and I know what you're going through, and I'm with you. You've got to trust me. So at the end of the book, after Job goes through all this suffering, he says in 42, 5 and 6, I have heard of you, God, by hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Is, he, is this physical? No, it's spiritual. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. You know, sometimes we go through suffering and we can't quite figure out why we're going through it, but you can get to a point where you start perceiving God and what he's doing. You start reading scripture that, well, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Spiritual, it could be persecution, it could be physical. So Job really starts to realize how God's working in his life. And now he says, now my eye sees you. I think he had come to a, like this writer said, a deeper spiritual intimacy and understanding by what he, what he put uh, Job through. Okay, a similar idea of, of this perception is knowing God. Now, a lot of people think, they ask you, do you know God? And most people are saying, are you saved? Are you a child of God? But can a child of God not know God? Yes? Well, you said, you got to give me verse. Yeah, First John talks, absolutely. The Gospel of John does too. Go, go with me to John 14. Because I believe all the disciples were saved except Judas Iscariot. And definitely by John 14, they've been waiting for Messiah. Now, Jesus is the one they've been waiting for. So he's got these disciples that are definitely lacking perception, <laughs> like we all do. We need to learn. So they're walking with the perfect Son of God, and they're learning along the way, and he's teaching them, putting them through life situations and then giving them uh, parables and teaching them what he's doing through all this. So in John 14, Jesus said to him, now this is one of the disciples, right? Who did he say this to? Philip. Philip. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I think I got Philip in the context, right? Thomas. Is it Thomas in 14.6? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, Thomas and then here's Philip. Coming up here in verse 8, his name is right there. So if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Wait a minute, John 1.18 says no one has seen God at any time, but they did see the Son. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus said to him, how long have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So Jesus isn't the Father, he's the Son. But he's so perfect in essence like the Father and shares that, that to see him is to see the Father. Now, notice he says in verse 9, and also verse 7, know me. Verse 9, yet you have not come to know me. Is he not saved? I mean, he's a child of God, but what's his problem? He doesn't perceive God yet. He's struggling. How many of you understood the Trinity and all the implications the day you got saved? Well, I've been growing in that since I got saved 30 years ago. So he he's, hasn't come to perceive the Lord in such a way, but he's learning and Jesus is teaching him. So I think this Hebrews 12, 14 is a sancti oh, progressive sanctification issue and a perception issue. So if you want to know and perceive God more deeply, you've got to keep walking with him. Let him train you. Let him take you through the training process, the, the disciplinary process. And you need to do it every day. Once a year at Christmas, I ain't going to cut it. Can you go to the gym once a year and get in shape? Eat good one day a year and then go train? And you got to do it regularly, and you can get out of shape pretty quick. Talk to athletes who took a three-month break. Or even longer. Some of those boxers... Boy, are they ripped up and ready to go, and then they take eight months off, and you don't even recognize them anymore, how heavy they got, and they just quit training. So we got to keep spiritually training to stay, I guess we could say, spiritually lean. <laughs> and, uh, and God will honor that. Well, verse 15, and we'll close with this. So see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, and let no root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by it many be defiled. So I guess next week we are at the top of the hour. We'll go through verse 15. Well, what does it mean to come short of the grace of God? We've got to look at that because Christians can do that. And they're still children of God. And then what is this root of bitterness? Uh, Riza pakrias. Riza is a root and then bitterness pakria. And it will, it will spring up and cause trouble and defile others or defile many. Now, there I got a lot to say about that, so I think we'll pause here and not go over the hour. And we'll return to that next week. So as we close tonight, just ask yourself, how am I doing with all this? <laughs> and, uh, and go to the Lord with it. Um, and I think the more you go into the Scripture, he'll, just by reading the Bible, have you ever read the Bible, you're so convicted that I'm not doing that well? Or you're like, okay, I'm, he does affirm through the Scripture, you're doing that well. You're doing what I told you to do. And I've learned that's why a lot of people won't read their Bibles or come to church. I said, I don't want to, especially I don't want a church that teaches the Bible, it's too convicting. I don't want to hear the stuff that the Bible says. So they don't come. Um, they avoid reading their Bible because it's going to step on my toes. Well, if you don't let God step on your toes, you're not going to grow. And we have to let him do that. Well, let's close. It's right at 8 o'clock. And see you next week for Hebrews 12. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your training program. 
And Lord, sometimes we don't show up at the gym. When you tell us to, you, we're not training as we should. We're not allowing you to work in our lives. And may we keep real short accounts when we fall away. And may we realize what we have to do. We have to go back to you. There is no other game in town. There's nowhere else to go. I remember your son saying in John 6, after feeding all those people, could be almost 20,000 people, they had their bellies filled, but then they all walked away when Jesus started teaching the Word of God. And then he looks at the disciples and asks them, do you want to leave too? And I love the words of Peter, and may we be this way. Where, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There's nowhere else for a born-again Christian to go. When we fail, we just got to return to our Lord and keep our eyes focused on Him and move forward. And Lord, please, I pray for Christians that they will not be duped by Satan to go somewhere else for some other program or some other way <clears throat> to replace your way. It's a temptation that a lot would fall into and because for some, your plan seems just too hard. But it's the only way. And Jesus said, our burden is light. I mean, he carries us through, and we thank you for that. So, Lord, as we walk with you, may we stay consistently close to you. And may we anticipate the coming of the Lord, but be about your business of representing you until he does return. We live in a culture as well that persecutes the truth, persecutes believers. Uh, so many have such a hard time with the Bible, they're trying to just get rid of it and trying to change what is there and reword it and reinterpret it out of its true meaning. And Lord, we're in that culture that's all around us with that mentality. And so may we just stand firm for the truth and not waver at all costs. And we'll ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.